Hey, North Lakers, it's Pastor Mike here. Welcome once again to our online worship service. I'm so excited for these next two weeks as we get to focus on our hope for eternity. So before we do that, though, I'm going to encourage you once again, take a moment right now, send a little text message to somebody, maybe send them an emoji or a funny gif or something that's going to bring a smile to their face. Let them know that you're thinking about them and praying for them. And then come right back here. We'll spend some time in worship, and then we will take a look at what God has to say about our hope for eternity.
love those two songs that we just sang. I specifically requested a third song this week, and it's a song called Awakening, a song that we've done for a lot of years, but it perfectly fits with where we're headed today with our message. So as we sing this song, I just encourage you to think about the words and maybe offer a prayer in your spirit that God would help you awaken anew this morning as we open up his word and look at what he has to say about our hope for eternity. So let's sing and worship together.
Awakening. It's one of my favorite worship songs. And every time we sing it, it stirs up my emotions and my prayer that God would awaken me and keep me close to him. I don't want to just know that I'm close to him. I want to feel it. And that is a perfect song to set us up for where we're going today. Almost like we picked it on purpose. My number one goal for all of us is that God would use this message to wake you up from a slumber that I believe all of us have fallen into. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, if we've never met, my name is Mike. I am the worship and operations pastor, and I am honored and privileged to open up God's word with you today. I love this series that we've been doing called Hope. You know, as we were planning uh, to kick off 2021, it didn't take long to realize that this is something that we all need coming out of last year, hope. It's been said that man can live about 40 days without food, three days without water, eight minutes without air, but only one second without hope. Hope is a word we're all familiar with. We all hope for lots of things. We hope that COVID will end. We hope we can soon get back together with our friends and family and in our church. We hope for a good night of sleep. We hope there's still some money left on our Woods gift card. We hope for a vacation, a good meal, a good deal. The list is endless. But as Christians, what do we hope for? We hope that God loves us. We hope that he's pleased with us. We hope that he hears us. I mean, we think we know he hears us, but sometimes he seems so far away. We hope one day we'll be totally free of all of our addictions and those chronic sins, even the ones that we keep hidden from everybody, except from God. We hope that one day, someday, we will arrive, that we'll reach the top of the mountain, that we'll be so close to God, we'll be like that one person we all know who never seems to have a bad day, who always seems passionate about Jesus. And yet deep down, we doubt that we'll ever be that person. What do you hope for? Let me ask you a question as we get started today. Have you arrived, spiritually speaking? Have you arrived? Has everything you thought God promised you been fulfilled? Answered prayers, health, security, a mental peace, a good life, a good home, a good job? Have you arrived at that place? Here's another question. When we look at life here on earth, what is the advantage that Christians have over everyone else? Do we have an advantage? And if we do, is it working? And if it is working, why is it when we look around, Christians as a whole don't seem any more happier or at peace than people of other faiths and other religions? In studying for this message, I've concluded that my faith has grown stagnant for one glaring reason. I had lost hope. Now, hope is a funny word. Our enemy, I believe, has robbed us of our hope in the word hope. You see, when we throw that word around here on earth, what we almost always mean is some future thing that might happen and we want it to happen. We hope it will happen. But you know what hope refers to in scripture? Hope in scripture refers to something that will happen. It's guaranteed. It just hasn't happened yet. Look at this verse in Hebrews. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So when I say that I, along with scores of other Christians, have lost their hope, that's what I'm referring to. We've lost sight of something that God assures us will happen. It just hasn't happened yet. So again, I ask you, have you arrived? Or do you feel like your faith has grown stagnant, melancholy? You know that you're saved and you know you love Jesus, but yet your life seems to lack passion, joy, peace. Maybe you're preoccupied with what Josh talked about last week, worry. Maybe you feel like this life is all about persevering and hanging on until you make it to heaven. But then there's that word heaven. You're not so sure that you're looking forward to heaven. Or maybe you, you say you're looking forward, but deep, deep down, 
you have no vision for heaven, and so you struggle. This message is titled, Hope for Eternity. Before I go any further, let's stop and pray. Father, I pray that you would awaken in our church and in anyone who hears this message a longing for eternity with you. Wake us up from our slumber. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There's three resources I've leaned on in putting this message together. One is a book called The Slumber of Christianity, Awakening a Passion for Heaven on Earth, written by Ted Decker. And if you're a fan of Ted Decker, he writes a lot of fiction. This is a work of nonfiction, a great read. Second book I've relied on is this book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. It's thick and it has more to say about heaven than any book I've ever read. Fantastic read, and I would recommend every believer to read this. It will give you an excitement for heaven that you may have been lacking. The third book is one that all of you, I hope, are familiar with. It's called The Bible. The Holy Word of God is filled with allusions to heaven. So let's start with this bold statement that Decker makes. This life is powerless to satisfy our dreams of great happiness and pleasure. These dreams can be satisfied only in a mind-bending reality that awaits us in the next life. As long as Christians are asleep to this reality, they search in vain for any lasting fulfillment. Christianity has become too preoccupied with finding true pleasure and happiness and purpose on earth rather than in the age to come. That's a strong statement, and yet it's one I agree with. We, I believe, myself included, are asleep. Asleep to what? We are asleep to the hope of heaven. We are asleep to the inheritance that awaits us, which leads me to my first main point. True happiness will never be found in this life. Sounds a little depressing, but hang with me. Read these verses with me in 1 Peter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's draw three quick points from these verses. First, we have been born again, but born again into what? We have been born again into a living hope. And this hope is 100% guaranteed to happen, just not yet. Second, that living hope, it's an inheritance for all who believe. And that inheritance is kept in heaven, or more to the point, that inheritance is heaven. Third, that inheritance is sealed by God, shielded by him until our salvation is fully revealed. Do you know when that salvation will be fully revealed? That won't happen until the very end. The reason that you and I struggle and strive so much in this life on earth, the reason that we ache and grieve, the reason that there's so much sorrow is that this life was never meant to be the reward of Christianity. Sure, God is always with us, and he sometimes does miraculous things for us. He blesses us constantly. He helps us in times of struggle. He sends his spirit to guide us and to fill us with his joy and peace and power. But please hear me, everything we experience in this earthly life pales to the life that awaits us, and that is the great hope to which we are saved. Why did Jesus come to the cross? Was it not to give us eternal life, everlasting life, everlasting life that begins now but doesn't reach its total fulfillment until heaven, and yet we settle we believe in Jesus, we commit our lives to him, and then we struggle and strive, searching for something in this earthly life that seems just out of reach. As C.S. Lewis puts it, our desires are not too strong, 
but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink, sex, and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We, you and I, we settle far too much. We have no idea the life that awaits us, and so we never think about it. We never dream about it. We never let our imagines run, imaginations run wild. We never think about that reward. Why that's as silly as somebody born a prince who never once thinks about what it will be like to one day be king. One of, Grayton's, one of Satan's greatest weapons against us is distracting us from dreaming about heaven or convincing us that heaven is going to be boring, that life on earth is all there is. Again, I say, true everlasting happiness will never be found in this life. We will only get glimpses of it, hints of what is to come. Let me ask you a question. Let's say that someone comes up to you, a non-believer, maybe your neighbor or friend or a family member, and they ask you this, what is the reward of being a Christian? What are the benefits? How will it help me? Now I'm guessing you'd answer in a few ways as I would. You'd probably talk about sin. You talk about God's forgiveness of sin. That would lead you to talking about Jesus, the Son of God who came to earth to show us what God was like, but also ultimately uh, to remove our sin from us. You would definitely talk about the cross, you would talk about the resurrection, and then what? You'd probably then move on to talking about growing to be more Christ-like, sanctification. You would talk about loving each other here, uh, loving each other well, taking care of those who are struggling, talking about what it's like to live in community, be part of a local church. Some of us may even talk about healings or miracles that we've seen firsthand or experienced in our own lives. And all of that is true and good. But I wonder, would we talk about heaven to this unbelieving person? Now, maybe you would mention that for those who follow Jesus, there's a promise of heaven. But to the unbelieving person, is that even exciting? Let me ask you a really hard question. Is that exciting for you? Do you ever paint a picture for that person of exactly what heaven will be like? Do we even know what it will be like? Do you ever dream about the reward that is waiting for you? Here's the problem. That person you're talking with, they don't buy what you're selling. See, they see Christians struggling with all the same things they struggle with. Divorce, pornography, addictions of all types, depression, anxiety, suicide. And then on top of that, some of them even struggle with guilt and shame because of their religious convictions. And deep, deep down, you may start to feel defensive about your faith and also feel unable to answer their questions. You know that you have faith in Christ, and yet you do struggle. And they don't have faith, and in some ways, they struggle even less than you do. You know part of what's missing? What's missing in this conversation is the great hope of our salvation. It's not just for the benefits of this life on earth. In fact, I might argue that's not even the primary benefit. If it is, we have a whole lot of explaining to do to thousands of Christians who were martyred and killed and persecuted and suffered greatly precisely because of their faith. They never experienced this great life on earth. No, what's missing is the great hope of our salvation. Heaven. Heaven and the life to come should always be part of the answer to anyone who asks us about our faith in Christ. Why is it so important that we wake up to our hope in heaven? Put simply, if the church, if Jesus' disciples, we who are being saved, if we take our eyes off of the great reward that awaits us, then all the responsibility for the benefits of the gospel fall to this life on earth. And when those benefits fail to show up, our faith goes into slumber. Or worse, how many people 
that you and I both know have abandoned their faith simply because they became disillusioned with their life on earth. What they fail to realize is that this life on earth was never meant to be the ultimate reward. Look at what the Apostle Paul says. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Think about that. That's a strong statement. If only for this life we have hope in Christ. I mean, that sounds like a pretty good hope right there. But if that's all we have hope for is in this life, Paul says, more than all humanity, we are to be pitied. As Decker says, we've turned our eyes to the benefits of Christianity for this life, and in so doing, we have fallen asleep to any true passion for eternity. Christians have fallen asleep to the promise of the afterlife, and we no longer dream of that great day. Their obsession for eternity is in slumber. Those of you who know me know that I love mountain biking. I love all parts of mountain biking. First and foremost, I just love playing in the outdoors. I love getting up into the mountains. I love the views. I love the smells. I love the forest. I love biking with friends and the camaraderie, the laughter and the joy and the shared experiences. So as last fall and early October, I was able to plan a trip to Leavenworth. And as soon as I made that booking, along with a couple friends, uh, Luke, who you all know, Pastor Luke, and Jeff Lamont, uh, as soon as we made and booked that trip, man, I started planning for it. And Josh had already been over there, and uh, he brought me into his office and showed me a couple videos of trails. And one trail in particular that he described as maybe his favorite trail in the state of Washington, called Xanadu. So what did I do? Man, I went home, I looked up Xanadu on YouTube, I went to Trail Forks and looked it up, and I started dreaming about what it was going to be like to ride this epic trail. So much that when the time for the trip came, I got to go a day early before Jeff and Luke. Man, I jumped in my car, I drove nonstop straight to the trailhead, got out of the car, hopped on my bike, and started heading up the hill. Now imagine for a moment, that after, the reaching, after reaching the top of the climb, the hard work, that the ride was over, that there was no downhill trail, there was no Xanadu, there were no epic views, no jumps, no rock slabs, no sweeping berms, none of it. Now that would be ludicrous, right? Nobody would even bother to do a massive climb if there was no downhill. It's crazy. Think about it. Our life on earth is the uphill pedal. Now there are moments of joy that happen, but they're fleeting and they don't last. There might be a little bit of a downhill stretch, but then there's another hill coming. You might stop, eat a power bar on the way up, but then you start climbing again. That's because this life was never meant to be the downhill ride. But I feel like many of us live our lives like our life on earth is the reward of our salvation. Now I have good news and bad news for you today. The bad news, in this earthly life, you will never reach the top of the hill. You will never come to the day when all of your striving, working, and longing will cease. Not only will you never find it, but you will always long for it. You know the worst thing about going and, and climbing a trail for the very first time that you've never done? It's uh, when you, you come and the trail levels off and you think, oh, I'm at the top. And then you come around a, a blind corner and you see another hill in front of you, a steep one. You want the good news? Here's the good news. You will get to the top of the hill in the next life. And it will be far better than anything you can imagine. Your inheritance awaits you. That is our great hope, something that is guaranteed to happen. It just hasn't happened yet. Paul writes, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Oh yeah, that trail called Xanadu, it was epic. It was amazing. We got to ride 
all of this. So this all brings me to my second main point for today. This focus on heaven fueled the early church, and it must fuel us as well. Let's look at a couple of spots in 1 Peter. I literally could have spent the whole message just going through scripture about heaven, but let's just look at a couple of places right now. <clears throat> Peter writes, Be alert and of sober mind, for your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. It's important to remember for a minute who Peter is writing to. He's writing to a persecuted and scattered church. In fact, most of his letter is focused on encouraging believers to stand up and stay strong under unjust suffering. With that in mind, look at these verses again. Be alert, sober-minded because of the enemy. He is looking to devour you, to take you out. But resist him and stand firm because we're all going through it. Now look closely at verse 10. This is the point. And the God of all grace who called you, where? Who called you to a great life on earth? Who called you to heal all of your diseases? who called you to give you a great job and a great family, who called you that you would never have any financial difficulty, who called you to have perfect peace and joy all the time. No, where did he call you? Who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. That is the reward, his eternal glory in Christ. And then what? After you have suffered a little while, he himself will make you strong. Peter is talking about heaven. Heaven was the great hope of the early church. It fueled them, and it is what, it's the hope that allowed them to stand up under intense persecution. And I think one of Satan's greatest strategies today is to get us to live our lives like there is no great reward. Or maybe worse, he gets us to think that heaven is going to be boring. The whole point of us persevering is heaven. If only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than everyone. I often say if we could all be taken up to heaven for just one day and then brought back into our earthly lives, it would change everything. It would definitely change how we endure trials and hardship we would be able to see them as much more temporal. It would also change how we receive God's blessings. We'd see those things, we'd taste those things as, man, this is great, but I can't wait. You know, it's funny, I actually know somebody who was taken up to heaven, and he wrote some amazing things about his experience. <clears throat> I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. His name is Paul. Paul got taken up to heaven and saw things, experienced things too wonderful to put into words. In fact, He's not even permitted to speak of them. It was after this experience he had that he summarized our life on earth. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. For in this hope we were saved. In this hope we were saved. Not the hope of a great life on earth. Not the hope of answered prayers, miraculous healings, or great families and jobs. We were not saved into the hope of an awesome church or a great small group. 
we were not saved into the hope of a better life than unbelievers. No, in fact, we may have a more difficult journey than unbelievers, but it is the life to come. That is our hope. And this hope is something that is guaranteed to happen, just not yet. This hope of heaven fueled the early church and it must fuel us once again. And this brings me to my third point. A vision of heaven is vital to experiencing joy on earth. Imagine that after you listen to this message, you get a phone call. It's from a lawyer's office back in New York. His secretary calls, confirming your identity first, and then saying that her boss, let's call him Joseph, the lawyer, uh, wants to do a Zoom meeting with you. This all catches you by surprise, but she assures you that you're the right person. So a couple days goes by and you have the Zoom meeting. Joseph goes on to tell you a story about a man named Ron, and you immediately remember Ron. He was an elderly man, somebody who didn't have family, and you befriended him, and you spent many days, many hours, playing pinnacle with him and listening to his stories. Ron was a great storyteller, and you two formed a great friendship. Well, Ron passed away not too long ago, after you had moved away. This catches you by surprise, and you feel a little pinch of pain, and tears well up. Joseph, the lawyer, goes on to tell you and drop a bombshell on you. He says this, what you didn't know is that Ron had a little bit of money set aside. In fact, Ron was worth half a billion dollars, $500 million. And that doesn't include his estate, a sprawling mansion in a place of unimaginable beauty. The real bombshell is this. As you know, Ron didn't have any family and he had few friends. He decided to leave everything to you. He wrote this will of sound mind and there's no mistake, it's all yours. Here's, here's the one catch. You won't take possession of it for one year. Uh, due to the unique circumstances in this will, the courts have decided to hold things for one year just to make sure there are no further claims. But the lawyer Joseph assures you, it's all gonna be yours. Question, if that bizarre story that I made up were true, how would it change you in the next year? Would it change you? Do you think you'd start dreaming about that day a year from now when you became uh, worth half a billion dollars? Do you think you'd dream about it, imagine it? You think you'd start making some plans for it? What if you hit some hard times in that year? What if you lost your job? What if you caught COVID? Uh, what if you had a friend or a family member going through a difficult time? What would you say? You'd probably say, man, just wait. In a year, I'm gonna take care of you. Church, this is our story. We have a windfall that is coming. We have hit the jackpot and our inheritance and reward is one of infinite wealth and unimaginable beauty. Look at these words. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul is talking about heaven. Set your hearts on it. Set your minds on it. Dream about it. Plan for it. Remember, this is a man who was taken up to heaven and put back on earth. He knows that what is coming is worth the struggle. As C.S. Lewis once wrote uh, to a woman who was dying, there are far, far better things ahead than any we leave behind. You and I will appear with him in glory, in heaven, the kingdom of God. You who have lost a spouse or a child, and the pain never goes away, it seems unbearable, Heaven awaits you, and all will be made new. You who are struggling with work, maybe you've lost your job, or maybe you're stuck in a job that you hate. This life, it's but a flash. So take heart, your reward awaits you. 
You who are sick, you who are terminally ill, or maybe you suffer from chronic pain. You've spent your whole life dealing with it. Do not fear, for God promises a brand new body for you. You who struggle with depression and anxiety, you wake up every day with a feeling and a sense of dread, and you struggle with sleep. Do not fear, for you too have hit the jackpot. And a day is coming when you will come into your inheritance and for the first time you will be overwhelmed with peace and joy, with laughter. Church, we must awaken from our slumber to the hope of heaven. Yes, there are benefits for all of us in this life, many benefits for us who believe, but do not be mistaken. That is not the hope for which God has called us. That is not the fulfillment of our salvation, and that is not our inheritance. We must wake up from our slumber. We must talk about heaven. We must dream about heaven. We must imagine that great day when we will be with him. So go ahead. What is your deepest heart's desire? Paul writes again in Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. In C.S. Lewis's famous books, The Chronicles of Narnia, he writes about four characters, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. And in these stories, these four siblings begin their journey unexpectedly through a wardrobe and find themselves in a land called Narnia, where they meet many amazing creatures, especially a great lion named Aslan. Aslan is far from a place far beyond the sea. Aslan goes on to inform them about a great prophecy that was spoken in this world called Narnia, about two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve, that will sit on four thrones and rule over Narnia and set everything right. They come to find out that they are the fulfillment to that prophecy. And as the books continue throughout the series, these four siblings find themselves constantly going back and forth from the real world into the Narnia world, only to wake up one day and find out that the Narnia world is the real world. Church, we are Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. We live in this world, but we belong to another world. In this world, we get hints, we get tastes, we get pleasures and blessings that are meant to remind us that we have a hope far beyond anything we can dream or imagine. We are citizens of another place. That beautiful sunset or sunrise, that amazing meal, that feeling you felt when you first fell in love, the joy you get from watching your grandkids play, a great book, a great movie. All of these are gifts for us to enjoy here on earth, but they are merely a mud pie compared to the holiday at the sea that awaits us. Until then, we will continue to struggle and strive, to work and toil, to suffer and hurt. We will keep pedaling uphill with some nice views along the way, a cold drink and an energy bar to keep us going. For this life is hard. And quite frankly, it's a challenge and a struggle. But oh, you just wait. It will all be worth it. So how do we wrap this up? This week, my greatest hope was simply to awaken us to the true hope of our salvation, heaven. But let me give you a couple of quick takeaways. First, it's time for us to let go of this life. What I mean is that so many of us are tethered to so many things in this life. Sports, money, relationships, hobbies, books, movies, our kids. These things can stifle us. Now enjoy them for what they are, but they are simply a momentary taste of something far greater that is to come. Do not be chained to them. A second takeaway, it's time for us to dream about heaven. So I've got some homework for you. Three things, three questions I want you to answer 
And maybe even if you were a journaler, get your journal out and write your answers down to these three questions. Number one, what am I tethered to that I need to let go of? What is it that you're clinging to, that you find yourself thinking about constantly, that you pour your time and energy into, and you realize, you know what? That thing, it's just a flash. What is it you're tethered to that you need to let go of? Second, have you been slumbering to the hope of heaven? In other words, have you believed the lie that the reward of your salvation is something you're going to get here on earth. And third, when you think about heaven, what comes to mind? Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would awaken us to our incredible great reward, a kingdom that will never end, where every tear will be wiped away we will receive new bodies, and we will be made new. Teach us to dream about it. Teach us to hope in it. Teach us to long for it. And may that hope fuel our lives here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, the million-dollar question. If heaven is the ultimate reward, what's it going to be like? Is it going to be one long, boring church service? Are we going to just sit on clouds strumming harps and singing I can only imagine over and over and over again? Are we going to know those we love here on earth? Will we even recognize our kids and our spouses? Will we remember them? What will we actually be doing in heaven? Well, all these questions and more I hope to answer for you next week. God bless you, church. <laughs>